Pick a spot, any spot before the cross. There are many places to sit, to stand, or lie down. There's room for everyone here, the curious, the committed, the captive, the concerned, the cautious, the careless, the critics. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your reason is for being here. It doesn't even matter what you're doing as a part of the crowd. Betraying, denying, ranting, judging, cursing, abandoning, despairing. All are welcome here. So go ahead. Pick a spot. Everyone belongs here. Because this is us. This is our humanity on display, not for the better, but certainly at its worst. This is the evil that men do, that we are all capable of, that all of us indulge in, in part, just a little bit now and then, thinking it's no big deal, but forgetting how we all play our part in the collective whole that is the brokenness of this world. No one here is innocent. Not one of us is righteous. Not one. There are no passive spectators to injustice and cruelty, to abuse and murder. We are condemned by our silence as much as we are by our accusations of blame and our protestations of innocence. Behold the man. Behold the man we have tried under false pretenses and beaten down to make ourselves feel better. Behold the man we have ro robed in royal purple and forced to adorn his bruised head with a crown of thorns. Behold the man we bow down to not to revere but to mock, to tauntingly knock him senseless and spit in his face. Behold the man not the man who would be king, but the God who became man even though he is king. Let us behold our king who is lifted high, not to sit on a towering throne, but to hang from a cross that belongs not to him, a cross that ought to be reserved for us, all of us. Away with him, Away with him, crucify him, put him to death. As people in and around the story of the crucifixion, we think we know what is happening and that we are the authors of this story. At first glance, it appears we have orchestrated the nightmarish symphony being performed at a place called Golgotha. But let us look again. Let us look carefully let us look closer. From our vantage point, we think we are putting a bad man down for good. But the truth is, a good man, a good God, is allowing himself to be put down for our good so that we can again be raised up to the life we were meant to live. What seems to be an execution born of humanity's drunkenness for control is, in fact, a willing sacrifice offered out of God's steadfast love. It is not we who are delivering a message of how powerful we are apart from God. It is God who is handing us a radical realization of our powerlessness, of how lost we are without him. Today, in other words, beloved, is not the day we defy Jesus by putting him to death. Today is the day Jesus dies by his choice in order to defy death for us. That's right. What Jesus does today is death-defying. Death-defying is an adjective it describes doing something very dangerous. We often use it to refer to outlandish stunts or impossible feats of skill 
or strength, like being shot out of a giant cannon, leaping out of an airplane without a parachute, or being submerged underwater, locked inside a safe with one's hands tied behind one's back. Death-defying. What Jesus does on the cross is death-defying, but not in this sense of the meaning of the word. What Jesus is doing is dangerous. It will cause great harm. It will lead to his death. But what Jesus does is not a publicity stunt, some parlor chick, or display of strength. Jesus is going to die. However, Jesus dies in order to defy death. Jesus defies death by forgiving our sin and canceling its wages that call for our demise. Jesus defies death by defeating the devil, the devil that strikes terror in our heart, reminding us we deserve death by haunting us with the fear of death that comes for us all. Jesus defies death by embracing the great harm, the grim finality that death lords over us with its shadow and then takes it to its grave. What we witness tonight is death-defying by Jesus. But we aren't going to perceive this. We won't understand what is happening if we keep living in denial about death. Jesus, you see, is death-defying, while we are constantly death-denying. And if we pay attention, we can see the difference between the two all over what happens tonight. Our first line of defense against death, the first stage of our denial, is to fight it. We will not go quietly into that good night. We will rage, rage against the dying of the light. Just look at Peter. When death comes knocking at Jesus' door, as the soldiers arrive with Judas to arrest Jesus, Peter tries to deny death by drawing the sword. Peter tries to be the hero again, as he seemingly seeks to defend Jesus with his life. Ironically, Peter, in trying to fight death, nearly propagates it as he takes his, a swing at an unarmed, defenseless servant and lobs off a piece of his ear. John makes it clear. Jesus had every opportunity to fight back against death. Before his death march even begins, Jesus, in just declaring his name, his divine name as I am, Yahweh, as the God who is eternal, causes his would-be captors to fall to the ground. As he tells Peter in Matthew's account of this scene in the garden, if Jesus wanted to fight back against death with a sword, he could have called down heavenly armies at his disposal to claim victory. But no, Jesus goes with his captors willingly, because Jesus comes not to fight back against death violently, but to defy death through his love. Like Peter, we try to deny death by fighting back. And like Peter, when we try to fight death on death's terms, whenever we seek vengeance, whenever we strike back, claiming to defend God, whenever we end up Trying to fight death on death's terms, we end up leaving a trail of violence and destruction in our wake, which is exactly what death wants. To follow Jesus is not to defeat death through a more powerful form of killing. To follow Jesus is to defy death by facing it with the same vulnerability, the same extravagance of love as Christ. As we all know, Peter's efforts to avoid death don't stop in the Garden of Gethsemane. When fighting back against death doesn't work, Peter tries to make a run for it, to escape from death, to hide from it. Hanging around the courtyard outside where Jesus is being put on trial, Peter tries to observe what is going on without being noticed, but death recognizes Peter. 
death knows his name. Peter is questioned as to who he belongs to. Isn't he with Jesus? Isn't Peter part of that death-defying band who follow Christ? Peter shakes his head back and forth in denial. Three times, Peter lies in order to avoid death by association with Jesus. Maybe Peter rationalized what he was doing was for Jesus' own good. Perhaps in the thick of his threefold denial, Peter reasoned, I'm not good, any good to Jesus if I'm dead. <laughs> I mean, better to live, to lie, right? And live another day, another day where I can spread the word about Jesus. I mean, how can I possibly tell others about Jesus if I take up my cross and follow him to the grave? Peter's not the first or the last person to employ this kind of logic. From our perspective, this is common sense. What Jesus asks of us, to die in order to live, to defy death by facing it, rather than running away as far as we can from death, this makes no sense. This is foolishness. This is the scandal of the cross. Which is why we don't pick up ours and follow Jesus. And so we lie to ourselves. We lie to each other about death. We think we're preserving something important. We rationalize our denials as saving our lives. But really, we're just avoiding the truth about what cannot be avoided. Because denying death doesn't change anything. Death will have its day, either on its own terms or Jesus's. At so many points during his passion, Jesus could have gotten away, fled, run off, skedaddled away from death, but Jesus never does. Christ may be bound up by the powers that be, but make no mistake, Christ stands before us as one who is free. No one takes his life from him. Jesus offers his life in defiance of death. He remains a captive to set us free, free to face our death and to defy it through him. Beloved, when we deny death, we deny Christ. Part of our call to follow Jesus is to pick up our cross and face death, to die to ourselves without fear. We must face death, our death through Christ, in order to defy it. And we can defy death, all of the countless deaths we endure long before our bodies give out on us because of what Jesus does for us tonight on the cross. Despite this, there still remains other forms of refusal we can cling to rather than accept our mortality. Beyond Peter, the religious leadership demonstrate yet another way we can and do live in denial of our death to self. It's a tried and true method, as old as creation itself. Blame it all on somebody else. The law of Moses stated the accused was to be given a trial. But the law didn't specifically mention the trial had to be public. According to the law, Jesus needed to be proven guilty, either by his own words or the testimony of two witnesses. But the law never specifically said whether those witnesses had to be telling the truth in order to, re to reach a proper verdict. This so-called trial advancing before us is a miscarriage of justice from the very beginning. The death sentence that is finally passed on Jesus had been decided before this night even started. This isn't an attempt to get to the truth. This is strategic, political maneuvering to bury the lie. This is denying death by turning the judgment we deserve around and pinning it on the other person. The blame game. We all know it too well. Our politicians are very practiced at it. And that's as much on us as it is on them, because we elected them. They represent us. The apple doesn't fall too far from the ballot box. 
And it's not just politics. When death points a finger in our direction, it's easy to go looking for a scapegoat. It's not my fault. <laughs> it is. It's not our problem. It's hers. Blame them, not us. If that indictment seems too harsh, observe what happens here. When this kangaroo court finally goes public, when the rest of the crowd gets a say in the proceedings, when the people are offered a chance to reprieve an innocent life, one against whom no real charge can be found, the mob chooses to release Barabbas, a known terrorist instead. How ironic, how telling. We prefer to reward the sins of those who are guilty rather than the one who takes away all of our sins. But then again, denying death by blaming someone else always works that way. The religious leaders thought in finally capturing Jesus, securing his crucifixion, they had saved their own skins. Like them, we tell ourselves it is better for one man to die for the people. We convince ourselves it's politically expedient for a few innocent people to die than for most of us to suffer. But really, who are we kidding? We say things like this. We vote for people who pass laws like this because we're afraid otherwise we'll lose everything we've gained for ourselves. In trying to deny death, we are willing to rationalize taking life, cheapening it, trying to manage and control it, even taking the life of another person in order to keep us as long as possible from death breathing down our own necks. We believe we can cheat death. We tell ourselves we've got nothing to lose living this way. But Jesus warns us, it profits us nothing to gain the whole world and suffer the loss of our souls. Imagine if we worshiped the kind of God we so often create in our own image, a vengeful, hedonistic God who is limitless in his permissions and yet unpredictably damning in his judgments. Imagine. It would be game over for us. Denying death wouldn't be an issue because we'd all be dead already. But today is good. This Friday is good. Because here it is revealed in all the shock and awe that we worship a God who doesn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. Who doesn't throw down fire from heaven to scourge the earth, but out of the passionate heat of his love for humanity pours out his heart to us from the cross. For the God who lives forever whom we presume to kill, is actually the God who willingly offers his life to die, to defy death so we can live. We can try to fight death. We can attempt to run and hide from death. We can seek to pin our death on somebody else. And finally, we can try to wash our hands of death altogether. That's Pilate's famous move in this story. Pilate is just trying to go about his day, you know, trying to ensure another uneventful, peaceful observance of the Passover takes place in his neck of the Roman Empire. And then he is presented with a man named Jesus. This man has been labeled an insurrectionist, someone who is declared to be no friend of Caesar. This Jesus is a leader with a following, and in the eyes of some people, he might just be a king. Upon further inspection for himself, Pilate finds no basis for charge against this man. Nonetheless, the people demand action. So, the appointed governor of the region, Pilate attempts to navigate a diplomatic solution. He has Jesus roughed up and humiliated and puts this man of sorrows out on display for all to see. But the crowd remains unsatisfied. 
They want their pound of flesh. Pilate tries to placate them with the customary Passover offering, the mercy of the court, in setting a prisoner, the people's choice, free. But Pilate's scheme fails. The mob chooses the wrong guy, the person Pilate didn't expect, because the people are out for blood, Jesus' blood. His frustration with the situation mounting, Pilate lashes out at the only person he can, the man whose life Pilate believes he holds in his hands. Do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you know that I have power to release you and the power to crucify you? Pilate keeps trying to release Jesus to avoid death, but Jesus doesn't budge. Jesus doesn't budge because Jesus comes not to avoid death, but to defy it. Jesus knows who he is. He is exactly whom John the Baptist declared him to be from the very beginning. The Lamb of God who defies death by taking away the sins of the world. It's not a coincidence nor some little detail that John, the gospel writer, informs us Jesus was crucified on the day of preparation. It was the day of preparation for what? For the Passover. For the annual commemoration of God's liberation of Moses and the Israelites from slavery in the land of Egypt. In that celebrated victory was the story of yet another ruler who tried to deny death Pharaoh, who resisted the nine divine plagues and remained obstinate before the tenth and most devastating plague of all, the death of the firstborn. A hearkening back to Moses' infancy when Pharaoh tried to control the Israelite population by killing male offspring as they were born. As the hand of death descended upon the firstborn sons of Egypt and Israel. Salvation could only be found. Death was only defied by the blood of the lamb. Blood from a perfect, flawless lamb painted on the door frames of their homes. Since that time, year after year, Israel celebrated God's defiance of death back then by performing the sacrifice of the lamb again. The day they killed and cooked the lamb was called the day of preparation. That day, this day, Friday, is the day the gospel sets for Jesus' crucifixion. God defied death once before for a nation. And now, as he always promised, God in Christ defies death once and for all for the world. For Jesus is the Passover sacrifice, the Lion of Judah who becomes the Lamb of God in order to defy death, to end our slavery to sin and to all that binds us from that which does not lead to life. Pilate, however, like Pharaoh of Egypt, remains unwilling or unable to see this. And so he makes the only move he perceives he has left. In a theatrical gesture, Pilate tries to deny death, to save himself by the washing of his hands. Pilate has tried his best to fix the problem, but when he can't fix it himself, Pilate absolves himself of all responsibility. It's a move to which we can all very much relate. We, you and me, we try to remain isolated and comfortable in our own little corners of the world. We work hard to stay consciously ignorant of all that is happening around us, right even across the street from our doorstep. We don't have time for anyone else's problems. We got enough stuff of our own to deal with. But then trouble finds us. Suddenly we end up being thrown into someone else's chaos. Another person's wrestling and struggle with loss, with death, and unable to look away, we're forced to try and do something. So, we do our part. 
We offer our ideas. We contribute what we think we can. We go as far as we're willing to go. But nothing we do is enough. Within the limits we have, the limits to which we confine ourselves, we can't solve the problem. And if they won't listen to us, if they won't take what we're offering, if they won't let me control the situation, then that person is all on their own. He or she is not my responsibility. We wash our hands of the whole situation just like Pilot. Washing our hands is an empty gesture that tries to cover up, that attempts to divorce ourselves from the other person, from this life we share together. Death surrounds us. We try to fight it. We try to run from it. We try to make it someone else's problem. But when it becomes our problem, when we have the eyes to see and the heart to feel the sting of death, the daily crucifixions born of injustice, inequity, prejudice, hatred, and neglect, we can become so overwhelmed, so frustrated, so defensive of our own privilege that we just try to take a bath and forget the whole thing. Our denial of death is most prevalent in the well-used tools of our indifference, our self-deception, and our self-aggrandizement. We make ourselves too busy to care. We overcommit our schedules so we have no time to help. We build better walls between us and our neighbors in order to distance and widen the line of responsibility we have for them. What in the name of heaven would we do? What in the name of heaven would we possibly do if God treated us like this? What if, instead of splitting down the middle, the veil of the Holy of Holies that limited access to his presence, God reinforced the barrier between us with concrete and steel? Thankfully, we do not look to a God who washes his hands of us. In contrast to the picture of Pilate seated on a judgment seat taking a cold shower, we have the image of Jesus who laid aside his glory to come down and wash our feet. The problem of sin is ours. The mess we've made of our lives and this world is our responsibility. The injustice and the poverty, the sickness and the abuse, the conflict and the chaos all around us are the work of our hands as we forsake the image of God in each other. We can try all we want like Lady Macbeth to scrub the blood off our hands, but on our own, the stench of death we carry on us does not go away. There are only two types of cleansing available to us. We can either receive the cleansing that only Jesus can provide through his defiance of death on the cross, or we can insist on denying death and proclaiming our innocence in the face of our sin. We can either receive the mercy and forgiveness of God or we can manipulate our conscience for the sake of making ourselves feel better. Beloved, we gather tonight either to live in denial or to live in defiance. We look together at the cross and at first we see the inevitable product of human depravity, of what happens when we fight back, of what happens when we run and hide, of what happens when we blame someone else, of what happens when we try to wash our hands of each other. But if we take a second look, a longer, deeper look, we will see divine redemptive purpose divine redemptive purpose arising out of the muddle of historical circumstances and the worst that we can be. Behold, the God who in Christ, 
who willingly, lovingly hangs on a cross to save us rather than exercise judgment and condemnation against us. Behold the God who in Christ offers us a death-defying answer to all that separates us from him, to all that separates us from each other, to all that separates us from ourselves. The first step of this divine act of defiance comes tonight as Jesus embraces the death we deserve. The final decisive step of defiance comes later when death once and for all will be put in its grave. My brothers and sisters, it's Friday and it's good, but Sunday is coming. Thanks be to God.